Hello and welcome. I'm Garnet Gilmore. I'm the Director of Marketing and Sales for Warwick Forest, your premier sponsor for the Lifelong Learning Society. We are filming from a one bedroom apartment that we currently have available at Warwick Forest. And I'd like to also mention that we have a promotion going on where we are offering the 2019 entrance fees on every independent living residence that comes available. We've really missed you. We've missed having you guys over to parties. We've missed seeing you at classes. We hope that you're staying safe and we hope that you enjoy the semester virtually. I am introducing the speaker for you today. This is Dr. Shippey. Dr. Shippey earned his medical degree at the Uniform Services University of Health Sciences in Bethesda, Maryland, where he completed obstetrics and gynecology residency. He also completed a Urogynecology Fellowship at John Hopkins Medicine. Dr. Shippey is subspecialty board certified by the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology in Female Pelvic Medicine and Reconstructive Surgery. Dr. Shippey utilizes his clinical and surgical expertise to care for women suffering with pelvic floor disorders. Realizing that every woman's condition is unique, he carefully correlates his patient's symptoms with examination findings and partners with them to craft individualized treatment plans involving minimal risk. Originally from Florida, Dr. Shippey is drawn by the water, socioeconomic diversity and military activities of Hampton Roads. A Navy veteran and father of three children, Dr. Shippey's interests include triathlons, ballroom dancing, sailing, and church activities. We hope you enjoy today's speaker. All right. Well, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Stuart Chippy. Uh, I am a, a urogynecologist. I'm told that there was a, an introductory video uh, that uh, sets up uh, who I am. So I, I won't go into too much detail. I, I retired from the Navy uh, over the summer and started work at, at Riverside in August. And I, I see patients at uh, a Brentwood, the Brentwood Clinic and uh, operate and take call at Riverside Regional Medical Center. So this has been a, a, a good uh, partnership that I've looked forward to for uh, many months and even years uh, before I uh, got out of the Navy and uh, hope to uh, really develop in the, uh, the coming months and years. Uh, thanks uh, to uh, Mackenzie Masterson and, and uh, Kirsten Watkins and Aisha Parks for uh, setting this time up for us to talk virtually. Um, I, uh, again, I'm not sure exactly what the uh, uh, introductory video uh, lets you know, what, but um, I take care of uh, women who suffer from urinary or fecal incontinence, as well as vaginal prolapse and other pelvic floor disorders. Uh, so uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, urinary incontinence and specifically stress urinary incontinence in women, which is perhaps uh, the most common reason for, uh, for women to, to leak urine. So I uh, noticed uh, as we were setting up here, a few uh, men joining the, uh, the uh, discussion and I, I wanna give a shout out, especially to the, the men that are with us here this morning. I, I, I'm told uh, something about the goose and the gander and all of that. And so uh, I hope, hope you'll be able to hang with us here and hope this will be uh, interesting for everybody. Um, uh, before uh, going uh, too much further, I, I, I think it is uh, reasonable and appropriate that we acknowledge the date. Uh, today is the 11th of September, and uh, it, it's uh, easy to, I think, lose track uh, amidst all of the uh, um, bad news, the concerning news over uh, uh, our acknowledgement of the racial injustice that has uh, plagued our country, the COVID pandemic that uh, has presented uh, such a, a health challenge and killed so many people, not to mention the, the fires that are waging uh, along the, the West Coast, that uh, it's easy to lose sight of the, uh, the memory of having uh, been attacked just 19 years ago. And perhaps some of you uh, lost uh, friends or family members in the uh, attacks on the, the World Trade Centers, the Pentagon, uh, and, and the, the crash of uh, United Airlines Flight 93 in, in Pennsylvania. But um, we, we've got plenty of time to talk here, so I, I hope that it's uh, uh, an appropriate time just to take a moment 
to honor those who were lost in the attacks, not as well as uh, others who uh, have been killed and injured in the war on terror that has waged since the attacks of 9-11. Thank you for that. Um, before I get started, uh, talking about the history of the surgical management of this condition, uh, I, I want to be sure that everybody is clear on what we mean by, by stress urinary incontinence. I, I understand there's a slide that has the, it, it's sort of the, the title slide, this would be time to, to bring that up. Um, so stress urinary incontinence is when women leak with cough, laugh, sneeze, exertion, any uh, thing that causes a, uh, even a brief pressure transient in the intra-abdominal space that gets transmitted right through the wall of the bladder and overwhelms the resistance or the back pressure that the urethra is able to uh, present to hold urine back, resulting in urine leakage. And this is di uh, distinct from uh, when a woman has overactive bladder and uh, leaks urine with urgency when she can't get to the bathroom uh, in time to avoid an accident. Uh, so there's uh, certainly uh, cases where uh, women have both conditions, uh, overactive bladder with urge urinary incontinence in addition to stress urinary incontinence, but it's going to be uh, the uh, surgical management of stress incontinence that we'll discuss today. And I should be clear that there are non-surgical options for management of both these problems, but uh, I think this is a, a, a good topic for uh, today to um, set the table for uh, uh, the history that led to the, uh, the development of what is now a board-certified subspecialty of OBGYN, that is urogynecology or female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery, which is uh, what I do. So is that, do we have the slides up? Okay, so should I be able to advance with an arrow here? Okay. Okay, I'm not seeing the slides myself. Pardon the uh, technical assist here. Thank you, Mackenzie, for helping me out there. There, so okay, there. good. Perfect. Got it. Thanks. All right. Um, so, uh, welcome everyone to the discussion of uh, stress urinary incontinence uh, in surgery for stress urinary incontinence in women. Uh, this is a, a brief history. Um, I'm going to actually start by uh, going back <clears throat> to uh, a time even before. Uh, surgery for incontinence to uh, uh, pay honor to this gentleman uh, whose name was Ep Ephraim McDowell, who in uh, uh, the early 19th century uh, provided uh, surgery for uh, many patients. This was before the era of anesthesia or antisepsis, but perhaps his uh, most notable patient was uh, this woman who's uh, depicted in the uh, the picture over here on the right, and that is Ms. Uh, Todd Crawford, uh, who uh, was uh, was thought to be pregnant with twins, um, but um, Dr. McDowell explained that uh, to uh, her local physicians that a 45-year-old woman is not likely to be pregnant at all uh, with twins or otherwise and that this was uh, more likely a, a tumor that needed to be removed in order to alleviate Ms. Uh, uh, Crawford's symptoms. She <clears throat> was a, a strong woman and uh, balanced this tumor on the pommel of a saddle while she rode 64 miles by horseback to uh, meet with Dr. McDowell in Danville, Kentucky, where he removed a 22-and-a-half-pound uh, cyst from her uh, ovary, uh, 
from one of her ovaries uh, through a large abdominal incision and a surgery that, um, uh, that the records would uh, say took 25 minutes. And uh, apparently she did pretty well after that surgery because uh, Dr. Uh, um, Dr. McDowell's records uh, uh, recall her uh, being seen the following day. Uh, and he, when he looked in on her, uh, she was making her bed and she didn't stay in his hospital much longer before uh, living another 33 years uh, at her home. Um, another uh, noteworthy giant uh, surgeon is uh, a guy who some may have heard of, uh, J. Marion Sims, who's um, coming to uh, uh, some notoriety uh, with more controversial uh, 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 perspective on his uh, contributions to GYN surgery, probably uh, the the most notable of which was uh, the repair of vesicle vaginal fistulas. Now, it's uh, to understand this, uh, you'd have to know a little bit about how uh, after uh, a woman has to uh, deliver a very large baby, a relatively large baby uh, pelvis, that uh, the head or the presenting part can uh, sit for hours, in fact, on uh, and even days uh, in, in some cases, on uh, an area of the vagina that can uh, undergo necrosis, uh, leading to a uh, the loss of tissue and a defect between the vagina and the bladder, or even the vagina and the rectum and back, resulting in uh, uncontrollable leakage of urine or stool. Uh, which is, of course, a debilitating condition. And this uh, w had happened to uh, three young slaves that uh, Dr. Sims was asked to take care of uh, and um, in, in, uh, from his home in Montgomery, Alabama. And between uh, 1946 and 1949, uh, Dr. Sims operated on uh, these three women multiple times. And this uh, portrait here on the right is um, one where we can see uh, Anarka, probably his most famous uh, patient, who uh, uh, the, the stories would have it that she underwent over 30 surgeries to, that ultimately were necessary to fix her uh, vesicovaginal fistula. And um, over here uh, on the left, you can see uh, Lucy and Betsy, who were her colleagues and uh, actually worked out to be assistants for each other in these surgeries that uh, that Dr. Sims did to ultimately lead to uh, repair their uh, their fistulas. So his uh, his persistence in uh, treating this uh, devastating condition was uh, uh, lauded at the time many years after that, but uh, more recently, uh, a critical uh, perspective on uh, the uh, this this history of GYN surgery uh, uh, emphasized his uh, not using anesthesia, which uh, was actually not at all in vogue at, at that point. Uh, many people were very suspicious of uh, the uh, the safety of using anesthesia uh, in the early uh, to mid 19th century. Um, so, uh, but this was probably uh, this as well as the fact that uh, these um, these slaves were a vulnerable population of patients and uh, could not uh, give proper written consent, as would be expected by modern ethical standards. So this is a you know a fascinating uh, ethical history, uh, but um, uh, it, more, more recently. In 2018, Dr. Sims' uh, statue was removed from Central Park in New York uh, at following uh, uh, considerable protest. So uh, fortunately, uh, vesicovaginal fistulas don't happen very often uh, in this country. Uh, they uh, can happen in developing countries and uh, um, I have actually uh, traveled to Africa to uh, learn uh, advanced techniques for uh, for fixing these fistulas, but these uh, 
uh, leaned a lot on what Dr. Sims taught us many years earlier. So uh, the more uh, common reason for women to leak urine is the, uh, the topic of uh, today's discussion of stress urinary incontinence. So um, I want to uh, fast forward somewhat here to uh, the near turn of the 20th century when we start to see uh, some urologists developing uh, sling procedures uh, to, to treat stress urinary incontinence. So what uh, they're, they're doing is uh, harvesting uh, material or tissue from the patient's own body to, uh, to bolster or augment the urethral resistance and, uh, and hold urine back uh, to keep it from uh, leaking uh, from the bladder in times of stress. So uh, Giordano uh, used the gracilis muscle, which is harvested, uh, he harvested from the inner thigh to, uh, to encircle the, the urethra. Um, Gable used this, uh, the pyramidalis muscle, uh, which um, was, uh, is a, a, as its name would imply, a pyramid shaped uh, muscle uh, anterior or superficial to the uh, inferior sit-up muscles uh, deep to its connective tissue or the rectus fascia that uh, he placed beneath the urethra in order to uh, augment its support. Um, and then in 1914, uh, Frangenheim, uh, Stockel added to uh, Goebel and Frangenheim's uh, procedures uh, by incorporating a uh, vertical attachment of the rectus fat, uh, again, this connective tissue uh, that envelops the sit-up muscles in front in order to uh, uh, add to the uh, supportive effect of the pyramidalis muscles that had been used by, uh, by Gable before that. So the final modification of this technique in 1917 uh, was uh, called the, the Gable Frankenheim Stockel technique. So there were further indications of the sling procedure that were reported in 1923 uh, by Thompson, who used uh, rectus muscle and fascia, uh, and later in 1929 by Martius, who used bulbocavernosus muscle, which uh, it can be found just outside the uh, vaginal opening and its uh, surrounding fatty tissue to place these beneath the urethra uh, in order to hold back urine. Um, before we talk about uh, the next uh, prominent contributor to the management of stress incontinence in, uh, with surgery in women, uh, it's go back here. I think I may have skipped over a slide. The, the next contributor I'll say is uh, uh, Howard Kelly. Uh, Kelly is uh, best known as one of the, uh, the professors of uh, gynecologic surgery at Hopkins and uh, at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And he, along with the other uh, famous physicians that were seen in this portrait, uh, were the um, the uh, laid the foundation for a lot of uh, modern uh, medical and surgical education. Uh, others shown in this uh, portrait include uh, William Halstead, the, the famous uh, general surgeon here, William Welsh, a pathologist, and probably most notably is uh, Sir William Osler, who was the, the professor of internal medicine and developed the first uh, postgraduate education training program in internal medicine which was the template for residency training in, uh, in the United States. And you can see uh, Howard Kelly, our um, gynecologic forefather here. Um, the, the thing that I should uh, point out here before um, going on to describe uh, Dr. Kelly's surgery was uh, is the uh, this diagram here where I want to orient you to uh, a, a, a sagittal view or a, a, a cross section of the female pelvis with the pubic bone here on the left, the bladder uh, here, the urethra, 
uh, and the vagina, the cervix, uterus, the rectum, and then the uh, tailbone of the vertebral column and back, the coccyx. So um, this is where the, the problem lies in stress urinary incontinence here is with the, the urethra. A lot of people think, oh, my, my bladder leaks, it's a bladder problem. But it's in the case of stress urinary incontinence, it's really a problem with the urethra. So I think that's a, a helpful thing to keep in mind going forward. And before we talk about Dr. Kelly's uh, surgery, it's it's worth mentioning something here about uh, another common problem that I take care of, and that's vaginal prolapse, uh, which is this, where in, in this uh, case, you can see the interior, the front side of the vagina, bringing the uh, bladder down with it, as well as the vaginal apex. And in this case, the lady still has her uterus and cervix intact. So you can see the cervix coming down some with uh, a little bit of uh, posterior or rectal wall prolapse. Uh, people call this uh, a, a cystocele if it's the bladder coming down in front, or the rectocele if it's the uh, rectum coming uh, down in back. Um, but I, I want to uh, use these two pictures to emphasize normal, abnormal, normal, abnormal. You get the picture. Uh, so this is prolapse. And when I show you uh, Dr. Kelly's surgery, hopefully that it'll make sense that this had uh, some utility not only in addressing urinary incontinence, which was its primary intention, with this uh, suture that's placed beneath the urethra. Here you see the urethral opening and the vaginal lining here separated on either side from the fibromuscular tissue that intervenes between the vagina in front or in uh, beneath the bladder, which is in front and deep to all this connective tissue. So uh, Dr. Kelly's procedure was a, a application of the uh, tissue beneath the urethra distally on the vaginal wall and more proximally a, a modification called the Kelly Kennedy modification of this technique used uh, stitches uh, to support the front side of the vagina. And that is that turns out to be the most common type of prolapse between anterior in front, posterior in back, and apical, the top, the cervix, or the vaginal cuff. And ladies who've had uh, a vaginal hysterectomy, the anterior wall prolapse turns out to be the most common. Okay, so uh, these are just the various steps that you can see where the underlying fibro connective tissue fibromuscular connective tissue is uh, exposed here by dissecting this vaginal lining or epithelium off of this connective tissue. And then these stitches are placed in a plicating fashion to support the front side of the vagina. Um, so um, this technique uh, was uh, relatively simple, safe, and at least for the short term was uh, effective in addressing both the coexisting anterior wall prolapse and it eventually became the, the go-to surgical procedure for treatment of, of stress urinary incontinence by GYNs for much of the 20th century. With time, uh, however, studies demonstrated that its uh, success in treating stress urinary incontinence was significantly less than retropubic suspensions and traditional slings, slings being what I started to talk about earlier, and retropubic suspensions being a topic that's coming up. Uh, so because it, uh, the Kelly-Kennedy procedure uh, didn't work that well for uh, stress urinary incontinence, it eventually uh, fell out of favor as an anti-incontinence surgery but it remained an acceptable tool in the armamentarium of uh, gynecologic surgeons for transvaginal correction of anterior wall prolapse. So uh, back to the, the list of fascial slings that we were talking about. By 1933, a, a urologist named Price described the first sling that was constructed of fascia lata. Now this is uh, connective tissue that uh, is harvested from the large uh, uh, extensor muscles of the thigh on the lateral aspect of the thigh. And we'll look at uh, some pictures of that here in just uh, a second. Um, 
This uh, fascia uh, could then be pla placed uh, beneath the urethra and secured to the rectus fascia uh, in uh, front of the abdomen, typically using permanent suture. And then in 1942, another surgeon named Aldridge described the rectus fascial sling that I'll show uh, momentarily. But I wanted to show these pictures of how the fascia lata was harvested from the, the lateral thigh, where the positions, the patient starts out positioned on her uh, left or right side, and then this fascial stripper device is used to obtain a, a, uh, a length of fascia lata that is harvested initially with an inc uh, incision as shown here, and then the, the um, stripper is placed along it to uh, obtain a pretty good length of that uh, fascia or connective tissue from the lateral thigh and then it's uh, split in half and folded over and uh, a, a buttressing suture placed here and then the skin of that uh, incision is closed over the lateral thigh. Um, then that uh, sling is placed underneath the urethra. Um, I, I um, have seen this done in, uh, in medical school and once in uh, internship, but I've not seen it done recently and I've not used this uh, fascia lata harvesting technique myself. Um, I, I, uh, I'm an OB-GYN, I'm not an orthopedic surgeon and so I don't operate on people's legs. Uh, so uh, if somebody else wants to uh, make this incision and harvest fascia, they got to be ready, I think, to manage a complication in that compartment, and I, I just am not trained to do that. So, uh, as I mentioned, Aldridge uh, developed the rash, uh, rectus fascial sling and first published uh, literature describing its use in 1942, and this, uh, this slide shows uh, a sort of curvilinear incision being made uh, on the uh, anterior abdominal wall. This is not unlike what ladies uh, have for a C-section nowadays, and uh, it, which is, uh, oh, by the way, the most common uh, surgery that we uh, do on uh, women anymore, perhaps excepting a, a, a DNC for a, a miscarriage or other um, intrauterine problem. But um, the uh, this is called a fan and steel incision. It's made on the woman's anterior uh, abdominal wall and is carried down to the connective tissue that envelops the sit-up muscles. And we call that the rectus fascia. And a, 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 a lengthy uh, rectangular segment can be harvested uh, kind of like the, the fascia lata that's harvested. And then it goes underneath the urethra. So to be oriented, this is, uh, this is sort of my view of the world uh, as it were during an examination where the, looking at the urethra onion and the uh, vagina here and then this sling goes on either side of the urethra and in back of the pubic bone and in front of the bladder and then the two ends up through either on either side of the midline where the sutures that are attached to their ends can be uh, uh, either tied together or tied to uh, the anterior abdominal wall. So these are fascial slings and um, I think uh, it's good to uh, point out here that this provided uh, a reliable cure for uh, recurrent cases of stress urinary incontinence and served as the foundation for a, a lot of modern uh, mid-urethral slings. These slings were typically placed at the bladder neck uh, and um, for most of the 20th century, though, they were used to treat patients with the most severe cases of urinary incontinence, those who had recurrences of urinary incontinence after, uh, say, a, a Kelly plication, uh, or patients who had what we call intrinsic sphincter deficiency, which is a, a condition of inherent weakness of the urethra, which might be surrounded by scar tissue, but is just uh, inherently uh, deficient in its uh, its vascular and other supportive structures, uh, but uh, they were not typically used as uh, primary treatment for uh, stress urinary incontinence. Uh, 
because of uh, problems with uh, increased morbidity, say from the, uh, the leg incision or from the, uh, perhaps a herniation through the, uh, the defect that was left in the abdominal wall despite its, uh, its closure after harvesting rectus fascia. And voiding dysfunction that could occur from placing the sling too tight underneath, uh, underneath the urethra, especially when compared with uh, other prevailing techniques. Um, so in uh, about 1949, the first uh, retropubic operation for uh, treatment of stress urinary incontinence was described by a urologist named Victor Marshall who was attempting to develop an op operation for treating urinary incontinence that developed after rectal resection in men, uh, where uh, the result of that uh, resection and deficient uh, uh, tissue was urethral uh, hypermobility. So the urethra with abdominal transients would, uh, would rotate or deviate from its normal location and uh, allow for uh, urine leakage with, uh, with stress, much like it would in women. Uh, so um, Marshall used a super uh, pubic approach to suspend the bladder and bladder neck to the periosteum or the outer bone cortex uh, behind the pubic bone. And uh, he used several stitches to do this. So I'm going to uh, point out over here to kind of orient you to this picture. We're looking from the woman's head down toward the pubic bone through this incision that's typically made transversely into a space called the space of retzius that is in front of the bladder and in back of the pubic bone, deep to the, of course, the skin. But, but the, uh, the abdominal cavity is all down here. So this uh, space has to be developed, and there's some blood vessels in here that, uh, that can ooze or even, frankly, bleed uh, not insignificantly. But so what uh, uh, Marshall was proposing was placement of these sutures in the periosteum of the, uh, the pubic symphysis here. Um, what this white line points out is uh, this is called the arcus tendineus fascia pelvis, and it is a point of lateral attachment of the levator muscles, or the muscles that we use uh, to squeeze and hold back uh, stool. So these are what women are contracting when they do a cable squeeze. But these, this is where these sutures were placed, and this is a sagittal view or another cross-sectional view uh, of the woman's pelvis with the pubic bone here, the surgeon's index finger being placed in the vagina here. And if, uh, if you look carefully, you can see the tail of this suture that's attached to a needle down here that's being placed in the periurethral tissue on the front side of the vagina along, on either side of the urethra. So this, st this stitch should not go through the vagina, uh, but the surgeon's finger is being used to hold up the anterior vaginal wall to provide that uh, target tissue where uh, Marshall placed his stitches. He then uh, collaborated with a couple of gynecologists. Remember, uh, Marshall's a urologist, so he uh, collaborates with Andrew Marchetti and Kermit Krantz to modify this uh, surgery to, instead of placing uh, a, uh, a, 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 a chromic absorbable stitch, he, got, he converts it to use permanent stitches between the, the periurethral tissue and the anterior vaginal wall. And he uses one to three of them uh, to, uh, to tie down. And uh, despite uh, cases of suture pullout from the periosteum of the, uh, of the symphysis pubis and uh, complications with pain related to a condition called osteitis pubis, this Marshall Marchetti Krantz operation became the standard technique for, for treatment of stress urinary incontinence women, in, in women for uh, the next several decades. In 1961, uh, uh, another surgeon does uh, the, uh, uh, the Birch procedure, and that's shown here, uh, and um, it's, it's shown alongside the, uh, the fascial sling. So you can see uh, these stitches are placed uh, 
without tying them down securely. So this is a suture bridge or a gap between sutures that are placed on the, in a similar uh, position on the vagina on either side of the urethra. So back to, to, to back up and get oriented here in the woman's pelvis. Here's the, the uterus. Here's the left fallopian tube and ovary, the right fallopian tube and ovary, the bladder and the urethra. And here's a magnified view with the bladder here and then these uh, suspension stitches or copo suspension stitches. So when we break it down, it's copo is vagina and suspension is the, uh, these uh, sutures that are placed that look a little bit like a suspension bridge. So uh, Birch's modification of Marshall Marchetti Krantz's procedures, instead of going through the periosteum, they just go, he just goes through a, uh, a ligament out here called the iliopectineal ligament or uh, the Cooper's ligament. And that gets rid of at least one problem, that painful condition of osteitis pubis. Um, he's also, uh, he also incorporates a, a thing called the Tanago modification around, it's described around 1976, that uh, then uh, uses just these two stitches and describes their placement at the mid urethra in, for one of them and at the bladder neck for the other, as opposed to one to three that had been used uh, previously. And, and Tanago emphasizes the, the suture bridge as, a pro, as opposed to tying these stitches down tight, which can result in urethral obstruction and uh, bladder outlet obstruction and uh, avoiding dysfunction and frank urinary retention. Okay. So, um, the uh, one drawback of these retropubic procedures is that they're being done through a, uh, an abdominal uh, in, incision. And so uh, in, in 1959, the first of a series of transvaginal needle suspension surgeries uh, to treat stress urinary incontinence in women was described by Perea. And so here you can see, uh, again, uh, the uh, vagina with the woman in uh, a lithotomy position uh, with a, a Foley catheter placed in the urethra and, and into the bladder. And this is the front side of the vagina with the pubic bone up here. And you can see these, uh, this incision has been made on the patient's right side where uh, a stitch has been run through here with uh, the needle on one end. And that'll be, uh, uh, the, of course, the needle will be cut off and then the, the two strands of it are uh, uh, held up on that side, as I'll show in a minute. And of course, there's um, a, a similar incision and stitch placed over on this side in order to place these uh, needle suspension stitches up above the anterior abdominal wall using a, 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 a retrieval device called a, a STAMI needle, uh, and STAMI was one of the, the namesakes of one of these uh, various modifications. There are over 20 modifications of Pere uh, Perea's initially described procedure that uh, place these stitches up, up above the, uh, out the skin of the uh, abdominal incision where they can then be tied down. Um, the, uh, Although these uh, vaginal needle suspension procedures were very popular in the 1980s and 90s, particularly with urologists, they were largely abandoned after a series of uh, several reviews and uh, randomized comparisons demonstrated to them to be significantly less effective than the retropubic copo suspensions and traditional sling procedures that I described earlier. So to this point, you have a bunch of uh, surgeries that are named after people and uh, frankly men that uh, are operating on women to take care of this very prevalent problem. But in uh, the uh, mid to late 90s, uh, a, a revolutionary technique comes along. And I'm just, I'll just uh, use this uh, moment to emphasize the impact of this. I would uh, describe only two technologies that I've seen in, uh, in uh, over 20 years of doing this job that um, 
have frankly revolutionized the care of very prevalent problems in women. The first one of these uh, is the Marina IUD or intrauterine device, a progesterone containing device that not only has been very effective in preventing unplanned pregnancy, but has also uh, decreased uh, uh, unpleasant uh, vaginal bleeding to the point where we don't really, frankly, do that many hysterectomies anymore. Uh, a lot of women still do get hysterectomies, but it's oftentimes after they have uh, uh, declined to have uh, a Marina IUD, or perhaps they've had one and it, uh, it worked uh, for a little while, but they didn't want to have it replaced. So anyway, that's one revolutionary technology. Another one is uh, this midurethral sling. So the tension-free vaginal tape midurethral sling uh, was developed in the mid-90s, and in 1996, Petros and Olmstan, a couple of, uh, of Scandinavians, uh, uh, surgeons, after having collaborated with uh, extensively with engineers, uh, developed and described this uh, procedure uh, that gained worldwide popularity over the following decade. It was placed in the mid urethra as opposed to the bladder neck. It was placed in a tension free fashion and it used a, only a small suburethral incision that was just a, a centimeter and a half. And then these small trocar incisions above the pubic bone here that uh, allowed for St. Day's uh, discharge. So this kit. Uh, as it was initially produced and, uh, and implemented, had these two trocars or needles uh, that would deliver this attached sling into place by going on either side of the urethra in back of the pubic bone and in front of the bladder. This, what you see here, is a handle that was attached to these trocars, and then this long, elongated device uh, was used to deviate the urethra through a Foley catheter to move the bladder to the opposite side uh, in order to minimize risk of its injury. And then cystoscopy uh, or viewing inside the bladder with a cystoscope was uh, performed after trocar placement to inspect for trocar injury and allow for adjustment of the, uh, the location of the, uh, the needle if a, a bladder injury was identified. Um, and that was all done prior to uh, adjusting the position of the sling in order to be placed in a tension-free fashion. Um, now, this is the original sling that they uh, produced uh, and, and it was uh, manufactured and um, uh, implemented on a large scale, first in Europe and then uh, more recently in the United States, it was called the TVT. I've often uh, uh, question why there's no F behind the first T because it stands for tension free vaginal tape to remind the surgeon not to put it in under tension so as to avoid the complication of your uh, urinary retention. So uh, this minimally invasive uh, outpatient procedure uh, was uh, very popular as patients reported less post-operative pain and in the past 20 years has effectively become the, uh, the gold standard uh, surgery for stress urinary incontinence in women. Now, there have been some uh, attempts to uh, decrease uh, complications of this sling. Again, these are some other good pictures of the, the originally described uh, urethral sling uh, placed in a retropubic fashion underneath the urethra and back of the pubic bone in front of the bladder with these little tails that come out the, uh, the suprapubic skin that are just cut beneath the skin. And a lot of women ask me, well, how do you suture that thing in place? That The reality is we don't. This is a, a polypropylene mesh sling that the body recognizes as being foreign. And so it mounts an inflammatory response. And, uh, fibroblasts or uh, fiber generating uh, uh, tissue cells are uh, throw down these uh, tentacles of fibers beneath uh, use in between these gaps or interstices between uh, along the length of the sling and that scars it into place such that despite there being no tension on it the urethra that uh, 
was mobile or hypermobile before under the conditions of these pran pressure transients that would cause the bladder, neck, and urethra to deviate as the, along with the increases in uh, abdominal and bladder pressure, that urethra can only go so far before it hits the sling, but it's placed in a tension-free fashion in order to minimize the complication of urinary retention or obstructed voiding. So the, uh, another attempt to uh, minimize that obstructed voiding complication, as well as to decrease the risk of uh, bladder injury, was this trans operator placement, as opposed to retropubic. Now, hopefully people can follow this procedure where you see the patient's right leg, left leg, the bony pelvis, and then this gap over here called the operator foramen, through which this curved needle is delivering this sling into place. And a needle could be placed from an inside out or an outside in uh, trajectory. Either way, the, <clears throat> the objective is to guide this sling not into the retropubic space behind the bladder where there is increased risk of bladder injury, but through the, <clears throat> the obturator foramen or space uh, where the connective tissue that envelops the adductor muscles of the leg can uh, allow it to uh, scar into place and hold it there without sutures. <clears throat> Excuse me. So then this is an, uh, yet another more recent uh, adaptation called the uh, single incision sling or the mini sling and that has uh, less data to speak to its safety and efficacy but is, uh, uh, is gaining in popularity and uh, we are starting to see some data to speak to its effectiveness. But th this uh, just goes in through one incision. There's uh, actually not an incision out here in the groin, as in the case of the trans sling. But these little, uh, I don't know if you can see, uh, attached to the end of it, these little barbs uh, then on the uh, pointed ends of it then are hooked into the uh, obturator internus muscle fascia and, and, and hold that uh, little mini sling or uh, single incision sling in place. Okay, here's another uh, good picture of that. Here's the better picture of the little dart that, uh, with the barbs on the end of it that hold it in place, okay? So um, we gotta talk about some studies because all of these, uh, <coughs> these techniques have been evaluated along the way but the more rigorous science uh, to um, examine their efficacy and safety has uh, taken place since uh, in this millennium. And there, there have been hundreds and perhaps even thousands of studies over the years uh, that have uh, evaluated these various techniques. But uh, I wanna just point out a, a couple here uh, today. Um, Starting with this one uh, that was uh, done by Ward and Hilton, which was a, a multi-center randomized uh, trial in the, the UK and Ireland, where uh, a, um, a, a couple of cohorts of women were uh, randomized to get either the TVT, the midurethral sling uh, that I just described, or the birch copo suspension, remember the suture bridge that we, we saw earlier. And you can see where they had 175 women that were randomized to, uh, to the midurethral sling and 169 to uh, birch copo suspension. <clears throat> and what they saw was a 66% uh, objective cure rate with the, the sling and a, only a 57% objective cure rate with the birch. Now, they, this looks like a difference, but the, the limited numbers that they were able to enroll actually uh, kept this from being a statistically significant difference. And Ward and Hilton drew a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of um, criticism for not being able to complete this, uh, this study that was uh, where recruitment was limited from May of 1998 to August of 1999, uh, owing to logistic and financial constraints 
But they had the, the data they had was the data they had, and they had to publish it. And what they saw was not surprisingly a longer operating time, longer uh, duration of hospital stay, and a longer return to normal activities after the birch, the more invasive uh, surgery that involved the abdominal incision. So one thing that I think is, is particularly interesting to point out in Ward and Hilton's study is in the, uh, the randomization uh, flow path where they started out with uh, all these uh, 344 women, but then of the one, 175 that were randomized to uh, TBT, you can see how, um, I'm just gonna have to look more closely at my screen, some withdrew consent, uh, some declined surgery, some were ineligible. But then um, over here in the Colpo suspension group, uh, 16 of them withdrew consent, and then five of them declined surgery, and a couple of more were ineligible for the trial. But I think that that is just worth pausing to, to point out that despite the, uh, the hard work of these, uh, these surgeons and researchers in, in, in designing this, this study and going to the trouble to obtain proper consent to, uh, to operate on, on these things and randomize them, that these patients didn't know what surgery they were, they were going to get before they, they went to the operating room. But some of them uh, looked at what was going on with the, uh, the mid-urethral sling, the more minimally invasive technique, and that, which was starting to gain in, in popularity there in the, uh, the, the late 1990s. It was starting to gain some traction, whereas people were initially very apprehensive about putting this polypropylene, synthetic permanent polypropylene mesh sling into uh, through the vagina into the retropubic space that was concerning to a lot of people, but they uh, eventually um, uh, it caught on, and women were happy with it. And a lot of women that uh, were Hilton, Hilton were trying to randomize to uh, to copo suspension uh, let them know that they weren't going to uh, to consent to that procedure because they. Um, uh, they, they wanted the new uh, device, the new technique. They uh, were uh, not willing to uh, have a more uh, aggressive surgery done on them, that, and they were starting to get a sense of uh, what would eventually be the findings of Ward and Hilton of uh, these various drawbacks with the, the birch and um, the trend towards improved objective cure. Now, it may catch your attention here that 66% seems like a, a, a pretty low number. Um, I should uh, point out that these, uh, these um, criteria include a urinary diary, a one, in, a one hour pad test uh, where uh, the uh, patients would report and um, would, uh, and the pad test would give evidence of urine leakage and then uh, even looking inside the women, uh, women's bladder and um, doing a, a, a test of the bladder for leakage. Well, the ultimate test is, is the patient happy? And uh, what, we, what we have seen in other studies is that uh, the numbers are a little bit more encouraging than just 66% of patients being objectively cured. A, a big theme here is that the woman may not be perfectly dry, but uh, may, be a, um, may, may be happy and would recommend this procedure or be willing to uh, make the same decision to have it uh, done uh, if she were in the same position again. Okay. Um, so this, uh, this is just the slide uh, depicting with uh, the withdrawal of patients in the um, uh, in, in Ward and Hilton's study. I'm going to talk about another study, and I'm actually going to come back to those prolapse picture slides. But this, uh, this study, stress incontinence surgical treatment efficacy trial. For some reason, there's an R, a little R there at the end of sister. Um, but uh, the, uh, in the sister trial, this was a, a randomized multicenter uh, comparison of with factual sling. Now you can look down here at the date of this. It was published in 2007. So now we're 11 years out 
from the, the mid urethral sling. And a lot of people are, are criticizing this study for, well, geez, what took you so long? We've got a, a new minimally invasive technique for, uh, for doing this, uh, for, for addressing this problem. Why are we still making an abdominal incision and uh, without using this permanent uh, synthetic mesh that seems to be working pretty well for ladies? Well, uh, it, it takes a long time to, to design studies, to get them approved, and to, uh, uh, to do the interventions and collect the data. But that's what these, uh, these folks did in a very uh, disciplined, uh, structured uh, 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 study that went on to be published in the New England Journal. Uh, but they, uh, you can see where they randomized 326 women uh, to Sling and 329 to Birch. So uh, more than Ward and Hilton. But they looked at 24 month success rates and, and found that they were higher for sling than they were for the, the birch and over in terms of controlling overall urinary incontinence. And then uh, when you just looked at, six, at stress incontinence uh, specifically, 66% of patients were, uh, had no stress urinary incontinence in 49, uh, if they had the um, the bladder neck sling uh, as opposed to 49% who underwent the birch. So uh, that is, this study is where I, I got that drawing that I showed earlier. It depicted the birch sutures in this slide and the, the sling here in, in this slide. We're in that frame of the, uh, the picture. Um, so so again, we're looking at this going, geez, these numbers are really low. This is, this is concerning, but I, I wanna emphasize that these are uh, very rigorous criteria and you, you have to um, apply some rigorous criteria if you're going to split out a difference in defining success between two different techniques, which are mostly comparable. You're doing the study to figure out if one's better than the other. And you really may have to look hard. You may have to subject the, uh, the outcomes to some exacting criteria in order to be able to, uh, to discern a difference. So in, in this case, patients had to be completely dry uh, to, uh, to be uh, free of stress incontinence with uh, a negative uh, stress test, no self-reported symptoms of, uh, of stress urinary incontinence, and no retreatment for stress incontinence. So these are, are um, well-designed, rigorous uh, studies that are being done uh, to, to discern a difference between the bladder neck sling and birch, but that those improved outcomes with the, the sling in terms of success came at the expense of increased urinary tract infections, increased voiding dis, uh, difficulty, and post-operative urge urinary incontinence. Back to the other reason that women uh, frequently leak urine is with uh, urgency and overactive bladder. These women would develop worsening or new onset urge urinary incontinence after the, uh, the bladder neck sling. Okay. So um, I think this is actually a, a good point to, to pause. I, you know, we've really focused the talk ever since uh, talking about Ephraim McDowell and J. Marion Sims in the 19th century. This discussion is really focused as the title advertised on the surgical management of stress urinary incontinence in women. And um, the polypropylene mesh slings that I mentioned that the Scandinavians designed uh, that have been so safe and so effective uh, as minimally invasive procedures for women uh, are, and are now considered the gold standard techniques for the uh, management of this problem. In, 20, in the 20 years since their implementation, they've uh, become popular, popularized in this country and they've stood the test of time in, in uh, hundreds of studies. So other uh, incremental modifications and uh, designs and surgical techniques accepted, there really hasn't been that much exciting news uh, to report on the, urinary, on the stress urinary incontinence front in about the last 15 years. So in order to bring us to the present day in discussing the history of, uh, of urogynecology, I need to veer off topic a little bit, and hopefully you'll indulge me in this because we're going to talk a little bit about vaginal mesh for, for prolapse, which I know uh, is on the minds of any woman who uh, hears me talk about uh, offering her a uh, 
mesh sling for stress incontinence. So uh, back to that picture of, of prolapse. I need to go back to that just briefly to, to show you normal, abnormal. Okay, so we're trying to fix this problem here. Normal and vagina uh, falling out, especially in the front and uh, to a certain degree there uh, at the top. So there are um, many surgeries that have been uh, suggested for, um, for treating prolapse, but uh, the most successful, most effective, durable surgeries for prolapse have typically involved abdominal approaches, abdominal incisions, laparoscopic approaches, or robotic approaches, and these are time-consuming uh, surgeries that uh, pose more risk of bleeding and uh, surgical injury to adjacent organs than the vaginal techniques that have been used but without as much success. So uh, surgeons in the, and the industry designers were inspired by the success of the, the minimally invasive midurethral sink that was made out of polypropylene mesh. Uh, so much so that they uh, conceive vaginal mesh in order to treat prolapse and augment the effectiveness of the, the native tissue repairs that were being done uh, vaginally in order to afford a minimally invasive approach with shorter operating times, less bleeding, and less post-operative pain. So this, uh, this sling kit that you can see shown here was manufactured by Gynecare uh, that was a uh, division of uh, Ethicon, which was in turn a division of Johnson & Johnson, <clears throat> which was the uh, original proprietor of the TVT, which was a, a, a technological home run, uh, frankly, uh, in treating uh, stress urinary incontinence, so much so that they tried to adapt that technique by using this larger mesh through vaginal incisions uh, in order to uh, address prolapse in the front side of the vagina, the back, and the top of the vagina. And so it's called ProLift, uh, and you can see a pretty significant burden of mesh that's going in through vaginal incisions. And so while this is a minimally invasive procedure, I, I would suggest the, the, the burden or the area of mesh that's being put in is not minimal. Okay, and this is uh, the perigee that's placed anteriorly and the apogee that's uh, placed posteriorly by another company, AMS, which I support, I, I, I need to uh, let you know that it is like Gynecare, no longer in business. They eventually had to fold under the, uh, the pressures of uh, defending litigation, largely related to this problem here where you see exposure or erosion of the mesh through the vaginal lining. Look, he's had other problems uh, with bleeding and, um, and pain after these procedures that uh, caused them to be redesigned with typically smaller mesh. And what's shown here is a, uh, a device called Uphold Light. It's a lightweight, smaller mesh uh, designed going through a smaller vaginal incision, and you can see it placed in the front of the vagina here, which again, the anterior wall prolapse is more common than posterior wall prolapse, uh, and uh, also more difficult to treat surgically. But you can see this device placed uh, with the uterus still in place. You don't have to do a hysterectomy, but if the lady's already had a hysterectomy, you can still use it to support the front side of the vagina. So that uh, was uh, manufactured by, that was the, the uphold device that was manufactured by Boston Scientific. So um, all with the best of intentions now for, for trying to use a minimally invasive approach to uh, treat this complicated problem of prolapse. So in uh, October of, of 2008, the FDA issued a public health notification to inform clinicians and patients of adverse events that were related to urogynecologic use of surgical mesh and to provide recommendations on how to mitigate risk and how to counsel patients. So following this public health notification, the FDA continued to monitor the outcomes of urogynecologic use of surgical mesh and uh, assert that the FDA's manufacturers and users device experience database over a three-year period between 2008 and 2010 identified uh, almost 2,900 uh, of these reports for urologic surgical meshes that included reports of death and 
functions. Among these, uh, about 1,500 were uh, associated with pelvic organ prolapse, and uh, uh, only uh, and, and less than 1,400 were associated with stress urinary incontinence repairs. But something to keep in mind there is that the uh, distress incontinence uh, uh, surgeries are being done more frequently because this is a more prevalent uh, condition. And we have a, frankly, at, by this time, a, a much better device that has been well proven in studies to uh, uh, speak to its effectiveness and safety. Um, so since the FDA uh, didn't receive sufficient evidence to uh, assure the, uh, uh, the, the risk of this, uh, assure that uh, the safety of, uh, of using vaginal mesh, as you see uh, the, uh, uh, the plaintiff's bar, uh, jumping in here, and uh, you see a lot of lawsuits. In fact, although there are fewer reports uh, to the FDA's database of problems with slings, there are more slings that are included in these uh, various multi-district lawsuits uh, than there are uh, cases of uh, problems related to uh, surgery for prolapse. Just a curious observation. So finally, uh, in April of 2019, the FDA ordered all manufacturers of surgical mesh intended for transvaginal repair of, uh, of prolapse to stop selling and distributing their products immediately. And the FDA had uh, determined that the, the manufacturers had not by this time demonstrated reasonable assurances of safety and effectiveness of these devices, which uh, was the pre-market standard that was now applied to them uh, due to their reclassification as type 3 devices in 2016. And since the FDA had not received sufficient evidence to assure the probable benefits of these devices outweighing their risks, uh, they concluded that these products do not have reasonable uh, assurance of safety and effectiveness, and the companies were given 10 days to submit their plans for withdrawing these products from the market. And uh, in, I, I should mention that in the UK, and New Zealand, these uh, not only have the mesh devices for prolapse, but all the, also the mesh slings that have worked pretty well for stress urinary incontinence, again, the topic of this, this presentation. The slings uh, have, uh, despite having worked well and uh, been uh, very safe for women, they have been removed from uh, use in the UK and New Zealand. Uh, so you can't even get these anymore. In the United States, however, the FDA has continued to permit their sale and distribution. Um, I, uh, let's see, I'm uh, at the point of wrapping up here, and I'm seeing a, a, a question here about a, a, an O shot, um, and uh, I wanted to I wanted to try to address that, but um, I'm, I, I'm just, uh, I'm not sure what the, the O shot is. I don't know if the, uh, the submitter of that question can, and thank you for the question. I, you know, I, if, uh, if you'll share your information with, uh, with Mackenzie, I can, I can certainly reach out to you and get back with you on that. Um, it's, uh, it's not a device or a, an interve intervention that I've used or familiar with. Oh, platelet-rich plasma. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, insufficient evidence is the the short answer at, at this point. Um, so, uh, I think that there's uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, of um, research that's uh, committed to these uh, these various non-surgical devices or minimally uh, minimally invasive clinic procedures. That, uh, that can be used, but um, they, uh, what, what's gonna take a while to, to generate is a, a fair um, and well-designed series of studies that, uh, that compare them with, uh, with surgical techniques. Another uh, thing that I, I didn't really uh, speak that much about uh, in this topic, though, was uh, periurethral bulking. Um, urethral bulking, if you go back to uh, the, uh, the technique that was uh, described in the uh, 
early to mid uh, 20th century where uh, fat from the uh, peri um, from the bulbal cavernosis tissue was used to, to bolster the urethra. That was sort of a a, a precursor to uh, uh, col bovine collagen and uh, uh, bony material or coapti that's been used, uh, as well as other uh, synthetic materials to inject uh, adjacent to the urethra. Those uh, those urethral bulking uh, techniques have been um, uh, somewhat effective, but uh, in a patient who is not a good surgical candidate or who uh, has failed uh, surgical interventions, those are cases where I would look at um, offering urethral bulking. So this is uh, this is my uh, information here. I thank you for uh, the folks that have uh, stuck with this presentation. I'm, I'm happy to stick around and answer other questions. Um, I, I would uh, look forward to, to meeting with you, and um, I, I will uh, look up the, the O shot and plasma, uh, more information on, on uh, platelet-rich plasma, and get back with uh, uh, the, um, the the participant who submitted that question. Thank you very much for for sharing that. Um, I look forward to communicating with you more. Well, if there aren't uh, additional questions, I think this would probably be a good time to uh, to wrap things up. Would you say, Kenzie? All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate your uh, your interest, and uh, have a great weekend.